Hello, my name is Lydia Radin, and I'm a whistleblower. And this video is for investigator Mike Wigder at the Special Prosecutions Unit in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Um, it's no secret, <clears throat> the, uh, the U.S. Marshals had to walk across the street and talk to this gentleman. I talked to him this past week. Today is Friday, December 2nd, 2011. And he asked me a few questions, and I'd like to answer them in this video. Um, so, sir, if you walk across the street to 500 Pearl Street, and you go to the uh, third floor, you'll be at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. If you go there and ask for my docket number 07-1359 um, CV, you will, um, you will get a file. Um, in that file will be uh, some documents. In fact, I put this on a CD and I'll be hand delivering and, and widely sharing this CD. Um, in that CD, you're going to find a, uh, a motion that's entitled uh, Appellant Lydia Radin Pro Se in Opposition to Motion to Dismiss the Appeal. It's 99 pages. You don't need 99 pages. You need less than 10 pages and just a few sentences. I'm going to answer your questions, show you how the Bronx District Attorney's Office lied to Congressman Weiner's office, and how Jimmy, uh, that would be James, a.k.a. Jimmy David, um, a dishonest doctor associated with my medical school, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University, I caught lying. And he's been stalking me and character, assassin a character assassinating me. So, um, I mean, really, what did you expect? I caught these people um, in a number of criminal schemes, one of which was federal student loan fraud. So what did you think they were going to say, sir? Lydia Radin's a lovely person. She caught us stealing money. <laughs> of course they're going to character assassinate, assassinate me. So um, I'm going to change the camera view and I'm going to show you just on a, a few short, uh, uh, just on the short video and on a, a few sentences and a few documents. Um, I'm going to show you how um, after May 2005, uh, about a month after Judge Patterson, oh, let me give you the big picture. Um, my medical school falsified my medical records, my educational records, and my financial records. I caught them stealing money. And um, in May of 2005, Judge Patterson in the Federal District Court, court ruled against me wrongly, erroneously, illegally. And um, about a month later, in June of 2005, I discovered an intentionally falsified promissory note where my medical school indicated that I was a full-time student during my second year of medical school in 1995 to 1996. That's not true. They lied. And when I asked about this, um, Jimmy David, who um, is a dishonest psychiatrist who lies about me, um, communicated with the State Guarantee Agency, that would be the Higher Education Services Corporation. This is a state agency that, uh, that uh, Judge McLaughlin uh, claims doesn't exist. It does exist. So uh, Jimmy David communicated with the, um, the state agency involved and said, oh, well, we checked the box that said she was a full-time student because we don't have part-time or half-time students here at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. He lied. In another student's case, there were memos that were released and uh, given to me, uh, wherein Jimmy David, as uh, Associate Dean of Students, explicitly comments on the full and part-time status of students. So the school was fully aware that they had part-time and, and full-time students, and um, this indicates criminal intent because um, a few years before Jimmy David had lied to the State Guarantee Agency, um, he was already commenting, and the entire promotions committee was commenting on the full and part-time status of students at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So in 2003 and 2004, I'm going to show you memos that Jimmy David initialed and that the entire promotions committee was aware of. Um, wherein they comment on the full and part-time status of students. And then in 2005, which I didn't discover until 2006, Jimmy David, in my case, 
lied to a state guarantee agency claiming that, uh, that there were no such thing as full or part-time students at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So let me cut to the chase here and I'm going to switch the camera view. Um, I went to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. I got my records here on CD. This is docket number 07-1359. And if you go there, um, you're going to open up a document entitled um, Appellant Lydia Radin Pro Se in Opposition to Motion to Dismiss the Appeal. It's 99 pages, so you'll know, you're, uh, uh, you know you've got the right uh, document. And if you go to page 68, which is where I am right now, um, uh, I had to actually put this into the court record. I can't believe it. Um, one of the marshals asked me about a 60B4 motion, so I'm going to show you what that is. This is a uh, 60B4 motion. This is relief from order or judgment. So. I was asking the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and Judge Patterson, look, I get relief from his May 2005 ruling uh, because I've newly discovered evidence. This is a 60B4 motion. Um, also, I have misconduct on the part of attorneys. I have fraud. Um, so I submitted this page. Let me just bring it down a little. This is the... Uh, this is uh, the rules, the, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Whoops, sorry. Let me go to page 68. Here we go. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And let me just bring this down a little so you can see it. Um, this is a Rule 60, Relief from Judgment of Order or Order. It's a 60B4 motion. And if I increase the magnification, what you're going to see is any person can ask for relief from a final judgment or order when there's newly discovered evidence. Usually, <clears throat> the newly discovered ed evidence should be um, within uh, a year. However, um, relief can be granted in the interests of justice at any time. The judge can actually do this on his own, of his own volition. Um, because you know, we don't have a court system where the game is, oh, let's make a false record, ha ha, and then we, de when then we hurt people. So this is a 60B4 motion, and um, you can ask the judge, the, either the judge in your case or the appeals judge, for, um, for relief based on newly discovered evidence, right here, newly discovered evidence, fraud. Um, you can ask for if there was a mistake, uh, surprise, neglect, um, whether there was newly discovered evidence, uh, fraud, whether it's uh, intrastic or extrastic. That means whether it was happening inside the court procedure or outside the court procedure, misrepresentation, misconduct of an adverse party, like when uh, Dan Rizal committed perjury, um, um, uh, you can, or for any other reason, um, in the interests of judgment, or for any other reason justifying relief from the operation of judgment. Now, usually for newly discovered evidence, it's uh, for about a year. But in the interests of, ju of in the interests of justice, you can get relief from a final judgment at any time. So, for example, as in my case, when the judge is the one at fault here and the judge, Judge Patterson, makes things up, fabricates, invents, the wholesale invents these rulings, just makes it up, and then when I appeal his, his judgment to three appeals judges and they refuse to uphold the law um, and they uphold these manufactured fabricated, wholesale, made-up rulings, which are extremely dangerous. They set extremely dangerous precedents that I, as a former student, cannot access and correct my records. Therefore, I should pay thousands of dollars for classes I never took. 
and therefore my medical school can wholesale make up uh, stories about my past that aren't true and lie about my past, these are extremely dangerous precedents. In my case and in the case of other students, Martin Bockstein, who's the root of the problem, he's the um, dishonest, evil attorney involved. He was the uh, general counsel at Yeshiva University. These are his criminal schemes. He wants to manufacture a body of case law uh, wherein uh, any school could lie about the student's past. And that's, that's his goal here. This is extremely dangerous. They're lying about my past. So in May of 2005, uh, Judge Patterson ruled against me. You know, they played this little game. And he fabricated these rulings. And one month later, in June of 2005, I discovered, oh my goodness, a falsified promissory note. And this is my falsified promissory note. And what I want you to look at first is you know that the school has committed fraud without getting into a whole lot of details, but you know that something's very wrong because, just to get the overall gestalt, right down here, the lender information is blank. Okay, so you know there's something really wrong. This is the promissory note. And part A is basically your name, address, two, two references, which I've uh, redacted or blacked out because you don't really need to know that. Um, um, you ask for some money, you sign it, you date it. And then uh, this part here is the part that's filled out by the authorized school official. And they're supposed to verify that you're a full-time student or at least a half-time student. And then down here is the lender information. Who's the bank that's lending, this, that's, that's lending this money? Now, you're not supposed to, as a student, leave the student uh, financial aid office or the student finance office without having a completed promissory note. So without, because as a student, you're supposed to know, you know what you're getting into, and it's the job of the authorized school official, that would be Mr. Lloyd Greenberg in this case, the student finance officer, it's his job to answer your questions. Now, when I was called down to Mr. Greenberg's office in my second year of medical school in 1995 to 1996, and he, he's bullying me, he sits me down and he's bullying me into filling out this form, um, and he's using these highly aggressive tactics. And his job, he tells me, is to get her to sign the note. Um, so, you know, he, he, he used, used, and I had other students um, confirm that this was their experience too. Part, the, the first part of this is uh, you fill out your name, your address, uh, uh, two references, how much you want to uh, borrow. You sign it and date it. And as I was trying to ask Mr. Lauren Greenberg questions, he refused to answer them. Then this promissory note was taken away from me, and I didn't see it again until years later, in June of 2005. The original promissory note was kept by Sally May, that's the loan servicing company. And right here, this is where Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Lloyd Greenberg and my medical school, including all the members of the promotions committee, the entire promotions committee, is confirming that I'm a full-time student during my second year. That's not true. During my second year of medical school, I was in a decelerated program, and decelerated students are explicitly defined by the school as not full-time. <clears throat> but you know, just on its face without knowing anything else, that something's very wrong here because the lender information is blank. And when I started asking questions, the first thing I asked was, hmm, when I checked at Columbia University, <clears throat> Columbia University, and um, according to uh, federal law, <clears throat> no school is supposed to tell you which bank to go to. They're supposed to say, go to any bank of your choosing. Um, if, and, and this is the question I asked, um, there are about 800 students in my medical school. There are about, a th uh, that's the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. Um, there are about a thousand undergraduate students and possibly about a thousand other students in other parts of the school. So let's say there's about two to three thousand students at Yeshiva University or more. And if the school is doing this, and this is the question you want to ask, investigator, um, if the school is bundling these loans, if the school is taking all of these loans and giving, funneling them into one bank, and the reason why this section here is left blank so students won't get hip to this criminal scheme that's going on. The question that I would ask is, 
are all the loans from Yeshiva University being processed through one bank. Because if that's true, then um, what you have here is a revenue source for a bank. And since when I was a student, and I know the rules have changed a little bit since, since I was at the medical school, but when I was a student, uh, some portion of our loans went to the bank for a processing fee. So let's say about 100 bucks per loan. And I'm just rounding the numbers to make it easy. Times, you know, 800 students in my medical school, times uh, 1,000 students in my undergraduate school, times another, you know, you got 3,000 students paying about 50 to 100 bucks to have their loans processed. That's a nice little revenue sh uh, source. So what the bank could do is just hire someone to process these notes. Certainly they would pay, if you do the math, they would be, get paid much less than um, the amount of money that's coming in to process these notes. Um, then what you've got is the school saying to a bank, look, I'm going to deliver to you a revenue source of a few million dollars every year that you're going to get for basically rubber stamping um, these student loans. And in return, I want something. So if I was an investigator, I would want to see all the promissory notes from the school going back about 20, 25 years, and I would want to know who the bank was. Because when I asked these same questions at Columbia University, I was told, we're not allowed to direct you or funnel you or, um, or, or, or become a feeder school for a bank. You go to any bank that you choose. And I, I, at Columbia, I was told, uh, we can't even you know, recommend or give you a short list. That's up to you. Um, also, when you <coughs> take out these student loans, excuse me, I have a cold. Also, when you, have a, uh, uh, when you take out these student loans, uh, all your questions are supposed to be asked. You are not supposed to leave the student finance office or the student financial aid office without having your questions asked, so d answered. So just on the face of this, you know there's something wrong. Um, the other issue is there's a state guarantee agency. And the state guarantee agency, their job, and they got paid, actually. Let me uh, go back to the state guarantee agency. The state guarantee agency got paid. <clears throat> this is the promissory note on page 69. The state guarantee agency is the Higher Education Services Corporation. This is the state agency. And the job of the Higher Education Services Corporation um, or the state guarantee agency is to make sure um, that schools deliver what they promise to students, that students are not taken advantage of. So um, I caught my medical school lying to steal money, and years later when they pressed false criminal charges against me, claiming they were harassed or annoyed that I had the temerity, the cheek, the gall to call the school and ask for my records and, and demand that they be uh, corrected and refuse to pay for classes and services uh, that were never provided to me, um, I was uh, put through the force of a criminal trial uh, to silence me, hurt me, intimidate me. And in the force of the criminal trial with Judge McLaughlin in 2010 in Manhattan Criminal Court located at 100 Center Street, they tried to create a fiction that there was no state agency, there was no state agency, there was no state agency to create this false record um, because what the school is afraid of more than anything else is a claim uh, from, on 42 U.S.C. 1983, denial of equal protection of the law. And in order to make that claim, a state agency has to be involved and culpable and liable, and they are. And that agency is the New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, who I paid a portion of my student loans. So this state agency has a legal duty and obligation to me, the student, because I paid them, not to the school, to commit fraud and help the school steal money. So page 69, investigator, is my falsified promissory note. Sally May is the loan servicing uh, company. And I did not discover this until June 20th of 2005 when it was faxed to me. Now, here's the other thing you want to notice. Um, in 1995 to 1996, 
I was not a full-time student. I was in a decelerated program and the school falsely indicated that I was a full-time student. This is box 21 which indicates my enrollment status and that's why they didn't want me to see this note. They checked the box that said I was a full-time student. I was not and if they were honest they would have checked the box that said at least half time because I was in a decelerated program and decelerated students are um, defined, explicitly defined by the school as not full time. So when I discovered this promissory note I said how come they're lying? Why, why couldn't they have told the truth? And what they wanted to do, what they, the, the excuse they came up with was well, we get the cash up front, and then at some point, you know, the school will deliver the services to you. At some point, you're going to get all these classes. Well, that didn't happen in my case because I was illegally expelled. I refused to sign a contract releasing the school from liability in my case. So they had checked the box that said I was uh, a full-time student. I was not. If they were being honest, they would have checked the box that said at least half time. Ultimately, um, in my, decel my decelerated program schedule was canceled, and uh, the school, I never took the classes uh, that the school said I should. And um, when I found this promissory note, I said, I'm not going to pay for classes I never took. Um, we, I, there were other students who were calling me and asking me for help. We organized up this information and the statutes and everything we needed to. We went to Congressman Weiner's office and Congressman Weiner sent this off to this uh, evidence of federal student loan fraud plus all the other information that the Bronx District Attorney's Office needed to prosecute off to the Bronx District Attorney's Office. And in October of 2005, Linda Tacoma, Assistant District Attorney Linda Tacoma, wrote back to Congressman Weiner and said, oh, we're not going to prosecute because you signed this note in 1995. And there's a... Um, a five-year statute of limitations. And here's what Linda Tacoma did not tell Congressman Weiner's office, because Linda Tacoma lied. And page 70, and this is submitted in the, uh, you can see right here, I submitted this in the, um, in the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And what I've done is uh, drag and clicked it over here for you so you can see it. And this is what's submitted. And this is Timeliness of Actions. Now, Linda Tacoma is writing back to um, Congressman Weider's office. This gives you the, uh, the, period, the uh, statute of limitations for pro criminal prosecution. And what she told Congressman Weiner, and this answers your question, Mr. Mike uh, Wigder. Um, he, when I talked to this investigator this week, he said, well, the Bronx District Attorney's Office is, uh, has, maintains the position that um, a prosecution for a felony is within five years of when the felony was committed. And yeah, that's true. You can see that right here. A prosecution for a, 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 any other felony must be commenced within five years after the commission of the felony. So you can see that right there. Right? A prosecution for any other felony must be commenced within five years after the commission thereof. But um, Linda Tacoma did not give Congressman Weiner full, true, and complete information because notwithstanding um, that rule, there, there's a, there's a one-year fraud discovery rule for criminal prosecution um, there, and that one-year fraud discovery rule says that a prosecution, I'm sorry, a prosecution for larceny committed by a person in violation, in violation of a fiduciary duty may be com commenced within one year after the facts con constituting such an, effect, uh, such an offense are discovered. So, yes, um, you can prosecute within five years, but there's also a one-year fraud discovery rule for criminal prosecution. And there's a two-year fraud discovery rule 
uh, for fraud in my underlying civil claims. So, Linda Tacoma writes to Congressman Weiner and she says, we're not going to prosecute for this uh, student financial aid fraud because Ms. Radin signed the promissory note in 1995. And it's been more than five years, so we can't prosecute for a felony because there's a five-year statute of limitations. What she doesn't tell Congressman Weiner, because she's engaging in a deceptive practice, um, she's pointing to a statute, and she's only reading this part of the statute. She doesn't go down the page um, to, to give full, true, and complete information. And what she uh, tells Congress, what she neglects to tell, con she doesn't t what she doesn't tell Congressman Weiner. I'm sorry, I, I have a very bad cold. I'm doing this, struggling through a bad cold. And I got this, um, this statute, and I highlighted it so you can see it. She engages in a deceptive practice, where she'll only read to the top of the page. And you know what? Let me show you this. Is I want you to get the overall gestalt. So what she does is she'll read to this portion right here, this highlighted portion, but she doesn't give the full, true, and complete information. She doesn't read all the way down the page. So I've highlighted this so you can see what the deceptive practice is. And here's how Linda Tacoma was not um, forthcoming and truthful with Congressman Weiner. She lied to mislead him. And what she says is, yeah, a prosecution for any other felony must be commenced within five years after the, after the commission of the felony. But she doesn't read further down and say, okay, well, notwithstanding the above uh, 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 provisions, a prosecution for larceny, larceny is stealing, committed by a person in violation of a fiduciary duty, a fiduciary duty means, you know, someone in a position of trust, may be commenced within one year after the facts constituting such an offense are discovered. So there's a one-year fraud discovery rule for criminal prosecution, and there's a two-year fraud discovery rule in my underlying civil case. So she tells Congressman Weiner, uh, listen, Miss Radin signed her promissory note in 1995. Um, she didn't discover this until almost 10 years later, so I'm not going to prosecute. But what she didn't tell him was, yes, you could have prosecuted. Uh, criminal prosecution has a one-year fraud discovery rule. And in Ms. Radin's underlying civil claims with Judge Patterson um, in the federal court, there's a two-year fraud discovery rule. So Linda Tacoma lied to Congressman Weiner, and she lied by not giving him full, true, and complete information. And this is the deceptive practice. She'll give you this much information, but she won't give you full, true, complete, and accurate information because her goal is to mislead this is the district attorney's office lying to an elected official. An elected official has, a, has, a, has taken an oath to uphold the law, and she's misleading an elected official who is trying to do the right thing. In other words, Linda Tacoma is not a prosecutor. Linda Tacoma is a co-conspirator, and so is the Bronx district attorney's office. And I have a tape-recorded conversation where Tom Cap, her boss, says, okay, well, we could have prosecuted. So the statute of limitations is till, uh, you know, another year till 2006. Again, he lied. When, <laughs> when the Bronx District Attorney's Office is, is engaging in a crime called obstruction of justice and refusing to uphold the law, we're way past federal student loan fraud now. Now we've got people who are sworn to protect us, who are, who are conspiring with my medical school to commit crimes and steal money. That's very serious. Now what we want to look at is a prosecution for larceny. Larceny is stealing committed by a person in a violation of fiduciary duty. Now is there a fiduciary duty with the medical school? Well, of course there's a fiduciary duty with the medical school. I mean, 
Judge Patterson is in the federal courts, and he's sitting there thinking as a graduate of Columbia University's law school that what? The law school didn't maintain business accounts for him. They didn't keep a record of a, they didn't know how much tuition they were charging him and how he was going to pay. Of course, there's a fiduciary duty. A fiduciary duty means that your school operates in a position of trust to you, maintaining your business uh, accounts so you can pay tuition and other fees. The, school, the professional schools are the keeper of your records for life. And in my case, they are lying about my past. So my relationship with my school didn't just end because they illegally expelled me or because I left. Okay, my school has an obligation to me to, main, to maintain full, true, accurate, accurate, and complete records. These people lied. You don't need the law. It's basic common sense. Um, should a student's professors in medical school um, operate with uh, an eye, you know, with, with, uh, in a position of trust where they would look out for their students and be truthful and forthcoming and ethical and moral and lawful in their dealings with their students? Oh, come on. These are doctors who are taking students like me into very dangerous situations where I could lose my life. And of course, they're operating in a position of trust. But because Judge Patterson has made an issue of this, this is fraud in federal student loans. So the question to be asked is, um, is the word fiduciary, uh, does the school have a fiduciary duty towards the student in the federal student loan program? Yes, they do. And in the laws, the Code of Federal Regulations that are used to administer federal student loans, the word fiduciary is explicitly used. So. We want to see the word fiduciary used. So let's go to the laws that govern federal student loans. And what we have here is, yes, there is an explicitly stated fiduciary duty to students. And when Judge Patterson ruled against me wrongly, erroneously, illegally, he quoted to a case called Moy versus Adelphi University. And Moy quoted, uh, that case law quoted the wrong section of the Code of Federal Regulations. I quoted the correct section of the Code of Federal Regulations and gave this to all the judges involved and all law enforcement and all the police officers and all the prosecutors. And let's read for ourselves the fact that in the administration of federal student loans, the word fiduciary is explicitly used. I'm going to read that to you. The school, as a fiduciary for the benefit of the guarantee agency, the secretary, and the student. The school, as a fiduciary operating in a position of trust for the benefit of the state guarantee agency, the Higher Education Services Corporation, the United States Secretary of Education, that would be Margaret Spellings in my case, and the student. So there's an explicitly stated fiduciary duty. The word fiduciary is explicitly used. A school, the school, as a fiduciary for the benefit of the guarantee agency, the secretary, and the student. And I can show you even more statutes where um, the words, uh, the, uh, that these funds are being provided uh, for the student, for the benefit of the student. Uh, the student is a, tr a trustee, uh, the school operating uh, as in a position of trust. I mean, I can show you example after example after example. Now listen, we're setting, the federal government is setting up these, these student loan programs to make money available to help the student. It defies common sense that there wouldn't be a fiduciary duty. Like, the school is supposed to be honest with the guarantee agency, with the United States Secretary of Education, with the banks, but not the student. It's okay for the school to lie to the student. That's ridiculous, okay? These programs are being set up to benefit the student. Of course, you're go you have to be honest with the student. No, let's lie and steal money from the student, as in my case. I mean, you do you, I really have to quote the law, or is this simple common sense? Okay, so getting back to uh, the documents that I uh, submit, submitted in federal court, and these are Judge Patterson, who's a federal judge who refuses to uphold the law, 
and the three federal judges to whom I appealed refused to uphold the law. So that's four federal judges who refused to uphold the law so my medical school can lie to steal money from me and Mike Tiber. So when I submitted this, I even put little notes here for, uh, for the judges and for everyone involved that said, look, a prosecution for larceny, for larceny committed by a person in violation of a fiduciary duty may be com commenced within one year after the facts constituting such an offense are discovered. And I'm, like, and I'm saying to them, look, I discovered this in Ju June 20th, 2005 is when I discovered the falsified promissory note. See, look right here. There's a one-year fraud discovery rule for criminal prosecution. And there's a two-year fraud discovery rule in my underlying civil claims. And look, there was a new act, a new criminal act against me when I was illegally declared in default in uh, May of 2006. So the criminal conduct towards me has not stopped. I've been illegally declared in default on a federal student loan that I'm not eligible to receive in the first place, and the school never provided the services. And the black mark of a defaulted student loan is on my credit reports every day for the rest of my life. And I'm getting threatening letters from the federal government. Uh, I'm the victim here. Uh, okay, now, this is back to uh, the papers that were, uh, my motion that was submitted in, um, in the Second Circuit, where on page 70, and I'm going to show you how Jimmy David lied. So just to review, um, page 68, this is uh, I have relief from judgment for newly discovered evidence. This is the falsified promissory note, page 69, where um, the school falsely represented that I was a full-time student. I was not. Um, here's the, um, the statute of limitations that shows that there should have been criminal prosecution. Uh, there's a one-year fraud discovery rule. So when I discovered the falsified promissory note a month late after a month after Judge Patterson ruled against me, um, there should have been criminal prosecution. And here's a letter from Jimmy David. Uh, this is James David. This is a psychiatrist who's been running around behind my back telling people that there's something wrong with me to character assassinate me. Why? Because I caught him lying. And here's the lie. Now, he's communicating with the uh, Higher Education Services Corporation, you know, the state agency that doesn't exist, and I'm discovering this on, in January. I'm going to start talking a little faster because I've got to get you through this. I'm discovering this in um, January 24th, 2006. Let me increase the magnification so you can see that. Okay. And this is coming out of uh, Martin Boxstein. The so this is January 24th, 2006. This is coming from, uh, just one second here, hold it. This is coming out of um, January 4th, 2006 is when I'm discovering this. And this is coming out of, um, let me take down the magnification just a little bit. This is what I want to show you. Okay. Counsel's office, that's Martin Boxstein's office. January 24th, 2006 is when I discover this. Pat Futia from the Higher Education Services Corporation had faxed this to me. So this is when I'm discovering it. And I want to make sure you can see all this. Okay, so. January 24th, 2006, and the important point here is Jimmy David lies. And what he says is, listen, we checked the box that said she was a full-time student on that promissory note because uh, we don't have, this is what he says, we don't have any part-time students. So, listen, we weren't trying to fool anybody. We just don't have part-time students. He lied. And here's what he says. He says, we do not maintain any student status that is designated half-time or part-time. And this is 
Jimmy David who's saying this, and ultimately I discover that this is a dishonest psychiatrist, James David. He was associate dean for students, and he's been lying about me and character assassinating me for years because I caught him. So here he says, hey, listen, you know when she discovered that falsified promissory note and we checked the box that said she was a full-time student? Um, well, that's just because we don't have any uh, part-time or half-time students. We don't have that. Here's how he lied. Now, these are memos. These are memos that were initialed by Jimmy David, and they were released in another student's case. They were released um, through, the, through uh, other students who uh, reached out to me um, and asked me to help them, and we were comparing notes. And you see right here, these are minutes that are from 2004. This is the Promotions Committee minutes from May of 2004. This is Jimmy David. He's initialing these minutes. These are the meeting agenda minutes of, um, the, these are the meeting agenda, these are the minutes from the Promotions Committee. The job of the Promotions Committee, it's a committee of, uh, I don't know, let's say 20, 25, 30 uh, doctors, PhDs who run the school. And look what they say. They say, look, they, this is happening in 2004. Jimmy David lied to the Higher Education Services Corporation, the state agency, the state guarantee agency for federal student loans, saying, we don't have part-time students. But right here in these memos, he's commenting on the full and part-time status of students. In fact, he says right here, as they're commenting about a student named Michael, he declined to switch to part-time. Really? Look at that. And here's where they talk about Michael. Michael, by necessity, continued on a part-time schedule. Hmm. We don't have part-time or half-time students, but apparently you do because you're commenting on them. And if we scroll down a little bit more, we're going to come to, look, more memos that are initialed by Jimmy David. And this is uh, February 2003. Remember, he's lying to the Higher Education Services Corporation in, um, in 2005, and I'm discovering this in 2006. So in 2003 and 2004, here are memos that are being signed by Jimmy David. These are initialed by him. And uh, I love this. They're, they're circulating a sign-in sheet for the meeting. And I'm like, yeah, the school officials who violate the rights of students, these are the people who are, who are, uh, who, who are, who are approving the minutes. <laughs> minutes of what? Even more falsified records? And... Uh, this is newly discovered evidence that I'm, that I'm discovering from the Abramova case and the Javon Patiar case. And if you look right here, oh look, here's another statement where Jimmy David is commenting on the full and part-time status of students. And here is another student that they're commenting, commenting on and he, they say Reggie would be allowed to continue in the curriculum on a part-time basis. Now, he's telling the state guarantee agency that in my case, we don't have students um, who are part-time or at least half-time. And here he is commenting on the full and part-time status of students. And look, here's another memo. And this is in 2003. This is another memo, and I got these memos. They were released through attorneys. Um, they were released through um, a student who, uh, who had uh, uh, an attorney named Tom Shanahan, who has a reputation for being an ethical attorney. So I can't be accused of forging this. Dan Rizell, who is a dishonest attorney, likes to accuse me falsely. Um, but these memos were released, and oh, look, here we go. Look, here's another statement where it's obvious that the promotions committee, the school, 
um, knows the difference between full-time students and part-time students because here's a memo where the committee, that's the promotions committee, voted the committee voted to allow, the name of the student has been blacked out or redacted, to continue with a full course load. So it's blatantly obvious that the school uh, is aware of the full time, uh, is perfectly aware of the difference between the full and part time status of students, and they explicitly lied about me. So I prepared some notes for you. Uh, my uh, investigator, investigative, uh, investigator Mike Windor, and I'm going to go through those notes right now. So, here we go, Mike. And I have all this on CD right here, and I'm going to uh, make you some copies and hand deliver them to you. You promised that you would uh, talk to some people and speak with me at the end of next week. So I'm going to make sure that I have all the evidence and information you need. So here we go. This is for investigator Mike Winder. Win, I'm sorry. This is for investigator Mike Wig, Wigder. Um, the uh, docket number, if you want to walk across the street to the Second Circuit um, and look at this for yourself, is 07 1359. This is the Second Circuit Court of Appeals located at 500 Pearl Street on the third floor. And if you go there, you're going to look at a motion entitled Appellant Lydia Radin Pro Se in Opposition to Motion to Dismiss. You know you've gotten the right, doc the right um, document because it'll be 99 pages. You don't need 99 pages. You need less than 10. And this is a brief synopsis. On page 68, you're going to see the, ru the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And you can read for yourself that a 60B4 motion can be made on newly discovered evidence. I did operate within a year. Judge Patterson ruled against me in May of 2005. About a month later, in June of 2005, I discovered the falsified promissory note, and I can ask for relief from judgment based on a 60B4 motion, a 60B4 motion based on newly discovered evidence. And also, I can ask for relief from judgment based on fraud. The fraud was perpetrated on me. Uh, there was attorney misconduct. Um, I can ask for relief from judgment uh, based on the interests of justice. Um, our court system is not a game, as Martin Bockstein and Dan Rizal and other dishonest attorneys like John Scarfone would like, uh, would like you to believe where you create this false record and then you go, nah, 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 I have a false record, ha, 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 that's just garbage. Um, so, and, 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 I mean, sociopathic to the nth degree. So on page 68, you're going to see Manny, hello, Manny, you want to know what the 60B4 motion is? I'm showing it to you, and yes, I will hand deliver the CD to make it really easy on you. So, um. Manny, what you do know is that Judge Patterson is a co-conspirator, and so are three other federal judges. You got four federal judges in your building, you know, one floor away, um, who refuse to uphold the law, are lying, are setting extremely dangerous precedents so that um, professional schools or any school can lie about a student's past. And Manny, these people almost murdered me. So. Um, Page 68, a 60B4 motion can be made relief from judgment based on newly discovered evidence, um, fraud um, uh, in the interest of justice. Page 69 is the intentionally falsified promissory note. I direct your attention to page, to box 21. The school falsely indicated that I was a full-time student. They checked, they checked the, they checked uh, the, the, uh, uh, they indicated that I was a full-time student in box 21 on the falsified promissory note during uh, my second year of medical school in 1995 to 1996. No, I was not a full-time student. I was in a decelerated program. Decelerated students are explicitly defined by the school as not being full-time students. And the... Um, 
the excuse that they made, oh, I should get to this first, page 70, when we presented this fraud to uh, Congressman Wiener's office, who sent it off to the Bronx District Attorney on page 70, you're going to see Assistant District Attorney ADA Linda Tacoma lied. In addition to five years to prosecute for a felony, there is also, in addition, there is also a one-year fraud discovery rule for criminal prosecution and a two-year fraud discovery rule in my underlying civil claims. So in May of 2005, Judge Patterson, 500 Pearl Street, Federal District Court, ruled against me wrongly, illegally, erroneously. He fabricated wholesale made up uh, rulings that were not based on common sense, that were not based on common sense, the facts or law. About a month later in June of 2005, I discovered the intentionally falsified promissory note. I should have been allowed to amend my complaint in the 60B4 motion based on newly discovered evidence, among other reasons and the judges, four federal judges, refused to uphold the law. On page 71, you're going to see the David memos, the one that I discovered that uh, Pat Futia faxed to me uh, January 24, 2006, where Jimmy David says, quote, we do not maintain any student status that is designated as half-time or part-time. That's why we checked the box that said she was full-time. And then you're going to go down to page 72 that shows that Jimmy David is an outright liar, where then these uh, David memos um, were quoting him where he's, uh, he and the promotions committee. Now, I'm discovering this in 2006. He's lying. Jimmy David is lying to the Higher Education Services Corporation to Pat Futia in 2005. In 2004, Two years before I discover it, David, Jimmy David, is commenting on the full and part-time status of students. He declined to switch to part-time, and Michael, by necessity, continued on a part-time schedule. These are, these are uh, memos initialed by Jimmy David. He's a psychiatrist who's running around behind my back defaming me, um, character assassinating me, because I caught him lying. So he's, this shows criminal intent. May of 2004, Jimmy David is fully aware of the full and part-time status of students, particularly with regard to federal student loans, and he's knowingly, willfully, intentionally, maliciously, with criminal intent, lying, saying, listen, we don't have part-time or half-time students. Yes, you do. You're commenting on them right here. And here's even more examples. And uh, this is the second page of notes I'm making for the investigator at the Special Prosecutions Unit. And, and what you're going to look at, um, investigate, investigator Mike Wigder is, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'm sure you'll correct me when I talk to you again. Here you go. On, uh, page 20, uh, seven, uh, page 73 and page 74 of my motion, um, February 25th, 2003, there's another David memo, initialed by Jimmy James David, uh, sign-in sheet that was, uh, that the Promotions Committee, committee signed, uh, where, again, they're commenting on the full and part-time status of students, Reg, quote, Reggie would be allowed to continue in the curriculum on a part-time basis. Oh, it looks like you have part-time students. This is happening in 2003. He's lying to the State Guarantee Agency in 2005, and I'm discovering this in 2006. And look, here's another David memo, and this you can find on page 75 of my motion. Um, April 2nd, 2003, there's another Jimmy David memo uh, page that says, uh, quote, the committee, this is the promotions committee, voted to allow the name of a student that's been redacted or blacked out. Uh, the committee voted to allow this student to continue with a full course load. So they know what a full course load is. So here we go. I wrote a little, little timeline for you. Here we are. In uh, 
2003, oh, the Promotions Committee, or the Committee of the Promotions Committee, the committee that's referred to here in this quote, the committee, that's the Promotions Committee. Their job is to monitor the academic progress of students to make sure that you qualify for federal student loans, because you're not supposed to take out a loan and then not do anything. So in 2003, Jimmy, David, and the Promotions Committee are commenting on full course loads, the, the part-time basis of students. In 2004, the Jimmy, David, and the Promotions Committee is commenting on the part-time uh, part status, uh, the part-time uh, student schedules. In 2005, I discovered the, the falsified promissory note in June of 2005, and I'm saying, how come you're indicating that I'm a full-time student? I'm a, on a decelerated program. Decelerated uh, students are explicitly defined as not full-time. Why didn't you check the box that said, you know, at least half-time or part-time? And Jimmy David lies and says, well, uh, we don't have any half-time or part-time students. Well, you lied because in these memos, you're explicitly here. Three years before and two years before, you're explicitly commenting on the full and part-time status of students. So Jimmy David lied. That's why he's bad-mouthing me, defaming me, character assassinating me. Um, in 2007, I go to Washington and try to discuss this with Margaret Spellings. She is the Secretary of Education and a cabinet member. Um, I also discussed this in February of uh, 2007 with Ralph Pagnozzi in Jersey. He was my landlord. Of course there was contact between my federal cases in New York and my landlord tenant cases in Jersey because I talked to my landlord about it. Um, in 2008, there was actually a landlord-tenant trial in Jersey. And again, the falsified financial information came out because I was like, listen, Ralph, I don't want to stay in this apartment. Um, I'd be happy to move, but my school has falsified information in a federal student loan program, had me illegally declared in default. Now the black mark of a defaulted student loan is on my credit reports for life. I experience fraud every single day in a long, unbroken, continuing chain of criminal conduct that continues today. And in 2008, I sat down with Rupert, who works in landlord-tenant court, and Mr. Lawrence Sedoni, who was supposed to be representing me, and I discussed again, listen, why are we spending all this time and energy to give Ralph Pagnozzi a hard time? Why doesn't Judge Nino Falcone and Judge Fast um, uh, just deal? And, and in the, um, this is happening in uh, the court on Newark Avenue in the uh, Supreme Court, um, but it's also happening in the municipal court, the city court in Summit Avenue with Judge Rodriguez, Judge Morena, and Judge Ray Velasquez. Why don't you just enforce the law? And I gave them case law that said in, uh, that a pro se litigant in a municipal court could have a city judge, a municipal court judge, enforce federal statutes um, and resolve the federal student loan fraud. So yes, there was contact between my landlord-tenant case in Jersey and my federal cases in New York. All of this is coming out in my landlord-tenant case and the municipal court, that's with Judge Fast and Judge Falcone, who was acting as an attorney for my landlords. Um, they refused to uphold the law in 2008. And in 2009, Jimmy David, dashed down to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, to Robert Morgenthau's office, to press false criminal charges, claiming he was annoyed because, as an aggravated harassment, because I was forced to call the school and try to correct my falsified records as they were used as a foundation to justify crimes towards me. And in 2010, I had to go through the farce of a criminal trial. Once again, because Judge McLaughlin at 100 Center Street in the criminal courts refused to uphold the law and instead created a deliberately false record with false statements of material fact and um, deliberate omissions in order to hurt me. And these people almost murdered me.